Nothing could be more important and compelling right now than the problems with the environment and climate change and all the degradation of the environment that we're seeing now. Some people might think it odd that a humanities research institute is working on things having to do with the environment and sustainability. We actually think that it's uh, very consistent with our mission to focus on the humanities as a socially engaged field of study and that that kind of social engagement makes us very interested in working on compelling social issues. That humanists are involved in researching sustainability and in working on solutions to today's environmental crisis. The Institute for Humanities Research at Arizona State University is dedicated to supporting uh, and generating research among humanities scholars that is humanities-based, socially engaged, and transdisciplinary. Those aspects of our mission relate to the mission of Arizona State University as the new American University and makes it very logical that we would devote our attention and energies to work on one of the most compelling social and cultural issues of our time, and that is the global environmental crisis, what we call sustainability here at Arizona State. Sustainability is one of these critically important um, values. Uh, it's as important uh, to our society as liberty or justice, uh, but it has not yet been integrated into educational processes. It's not been yet integrated into learning, teaching, and discovery environments at, at a level that allows uh, sustainability as a social outcome, as a core social objective, as a core social value to be a part of everything that we do. And so the Institute for Humanities Research has been involved in projects having to do with the environment and sustainability for three years. We started with a working group of faculty that representing all the departments and programs and centers in the humanities. Our involvement grew from our sponsorship of the faculty working group to our uh, sponsorship and co-sponsorship of many other projects related to the humanities and envi the environment. One of those was Worldwide Views on Global Warming, which uh, involved ordinary citizens in the political process of environmental policy making by asking them to prioritize their values related to the environment. This film looks at how the three themes, values, affect, and scale, are key to conversations surrounding the environmental humanities and sustainability. So what we've done in this film is we've taken a look at three projects here at ASU that we think best represent these three themes and their importance to these conversations. Julie Anand's Material Histories Projects makes values visible. Julie's photographs revalue what some would call trash. Her picture planes, which are stripped of context, are evocative of places and parts of ecosystems that may be missing. Her work calls upon us to consider what we value and why and what all this has to do with sustainability and the environmental future. Affect is a feeling or emotion. Concepts of place and sense of place point to the feelings and emotions that humans often invest in particular places. Joan McGregor and Dan Schilling's NEH Institute, which focuses on Aldo Leopold, has been instrumental in helping us understand the ethical relation of human beings to the environment they inhabit. Leopold's writings emphasize how emotional or affective attachments to place and decisions about how we restore, conserve, protect, or use places and natural resources is always guided by our values. Places are always changing over time, through history, and across geographies. The humanities can help us see what we might not otherwise see and go places we might not otherwise go. Mark Klett's work revisions and revisits iconic photographs of Yosemite and the Grand Canyon that have become statements of cultural value upon the monumental scale of those places. His more recent photographs become visual layers in a shifting strata of cultural perspectives on place, through time, across geography, and through space. He shows us that places at both large and small scale are constantly changing and calls upon us to become more aware of these dynamics at both the large and small scale.
My name is Julia Nunn, and I'm an artist and assistant professor in the School of Art. Um, I teach in the photography area and also develop courses that serve as connective tissue between photography and other disciplines. The, the project I'm working on, Material Histories, were uh, first exhibited in the context of an exhibition at the ASU Art Museum. They're large-scale photographic works that uh, I generate in response to going for a walk within a certain environment. I'm interested in, in seeing now, seeing my life, my walk, as being part, that I'm part of a civilization and part of a civilization leaving a record. So this, this piece comes from a walk I made on, in Northern California, a uh, pretty pristine coastline. And actually, when I was visiting my sister who lives there uh, and suggested to her that I have this project, she, she warned me that it was, uh, it was very clean where she lives and that she wasn't sure I was gonna be able to um, what, you know, if I would find anything there. So I'm, I'm always interested in the way that what's actually present around us is so often invisible. I think that a lot of times when we start to ask questions about sustainability, we uh, immediately go to technologic and scientific solutions, which are absolutely part of the resources that we need, and we, we need as many disciplines and creative enter enterprise, creative energy, as, as possible. Our behaviors are informed by ideas and philosophies, and those, those ideas and philosophies are actually the foundation of how we behave in the world. So one of the things that, that artists and writers do in this discussion is ask us to rethink the assumptions that we've made about what our relationship is to the natural world, for example. One of the things that the pieces end up doing, um, I think they, they describe both, both place and, and time. And sometimes the time is, is layered. But in this case, we're, I was walking on, New, on Christmas Eve. So some of the artifacts, contemporary artifacts, end up uh, describing that holiday um, time, which is a particularly consumptive time. So we've got the um, holiday plate and bits of tinsel. And then there are, of course, layers of time being described here as well. I'm interested in how um, place informs behavior, but then the behavior comes to be represented in the record in, on site. We use the word consumption to describe this uh, taking in of, of material and resources. But I think that the word doesn't acknowledge the, the residue that actually everything, so many things that we, we consume, um, it's incomplete. My name is uh, Joan McGregor. I'm a professor of philosophy in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies at Arizona State University. Hi, my name is Dan Schilling. I'm a project coordinator for the Institute for Humanities Research at ASU. I've been working on the humanities and environmental issues for perhaps 20 years, but more recently uh, co-directed the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institute on Aldo Leopold. The Institute brought together 25 faculty from around the country from a variety of disciplines to study for four weeks about the role that uh, Aldo Leopold's work, the Sound County Almanac in particular, uh, was really the, the impetus for the environmental ethics movement in this country. Well, one of the things that's interesting about Leopold's work is that 
he didn't just have uh, us think about having a kind of intellectual relationship to the land, but really see the land as something that we come to love and, and admire and respect the systems that are part of the biotic community, communities. And so that was really to sort of change the idea of how we see our relationship with land, with animals, with, you know, with this world we live in. And, um, and, and, and see the kind of the role of, of our affections or our emotions to that. And so, and that's to change our relationship to the land is not the, seeing it as a pure commodity, as a thing that we own and we can dispose of and a kind of fungible thing, but rather seeing it as something that we have a, a relationship with. One of the arguments we've been making is that Aldo Leopold is really one of the first modern voices for sustainability, even though he never uses the word in San County Almanac or his hundreds of essays, he's had a great effect on a whole generation of people now who care about the land, who work in land management, who are farmers, who are agriculturalists, who you know, are people working in our environmental organizations. He's really one of the, you might say, you know, founding fathers of, of today's movement. Leopold is one of the first voices um, to, to, to not see that we, to, to sort of expand that moral universe, to say that we, that we owe moral obligations to more than just humans, that we owe obligations to the land itself. And this is really what spawned out of this as a kind of view about a biocentrism, what a kind of biocentrism or a, 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 a view that, uh, that the moral community is much more expansive than just humans. Thinking about affect, I'm, I've always, and this is again, I think where Leopold's work resonates with me, uh, as a, as a philosopher and thinking about morality, I've always believed that the only way people get motivated to behave morally is if they have certain kinds of, 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 of sentiments or affections to the things that, were, uh, uh, that they owe obligations or, or duties to. The idea that Leopold puts forth, for instance, about wilderness in the 20s, you know, he's responsible for the nation's first wilderness area in New Mexico, the Gila. So we see how these ideas of bringing in you know, different cultures and the very notion that land is, has a right by itself to exist. It doesn't have to be an economic argument. And that's his great contribution. He says that we need to get out of our economic silos, our economic way of thinking about land that there is something grander there, there's something greater there. I think what, what Leopold was getting us is to, is to see is to have those same kinds of affections to animals, to the land, and then you, you can develop that moral relationship. If you see it as a, as a thing, as an object only, and, and have no kind of sentiment towards it, then you're not going to see it as something that you're in a moral relationship with. And so when we think about humans, they, the reason that they, that they you know, behave morally is that they, they're concerned about human suffering. We're better able to have a serious deliberation about the topic if we get out of the sensationalism and if we get out of the shouting at one another, and if we really understand it historically. If we really consider what philosophers and religious voices have said, if we look at the way the issue has been demonstrated and articulated and debated, let's say in literature, to bring all those perspectives to bear on the topic, it will have a much richer understanding of the topic than if we just consider it from one narrow perspective. And that's really what the humanities one of the reasons we still have the National Endowment for the Humanities, one of the reasons we still teach literature in school, is that it provides our students and our future policymakers a broader understanding of the topic. I mean, I, as an artist, uh, what I do crosses over with so many different fields. And I, I think that what I'm interested in is that I'm interested in, in the place where land and culture and time all collide. When, when they come together, uh, that's an exciting place for me. And I, I think that collision point is also a point of interest for a lot of other areas, uh, historians, anthropologists, uh, political scientists, you know, sociologists. All these different people have the same interests, and so we come together. I mean, my specialty just has to do with happens with pictures and how I can express that visually. My work begins with historic images uh, 
photographs, but also drawings, paintings, uh, as, a, as a way of understanding our relationship to how space, how a, a place that's, that's as iconographic and as important as the Grand Canyon to our national sense of, of identity has been depicted uh, through images. But as a photographer, I need to uh, understand what other people are doing to feed into what I do. And what's sort of exciting about it is that all these things are not unrelated, they're all related, and they really come together in these places. So we, we, have, a, we have a collision point that depends on geography, in a sense. Charting the Canyon Project uh, is a, another way of looking at the Grand Canyon based on the historic images that were made there. Uh, the Grand Canyon represents, geologically, a very large uh, span of time. But more importantly for me, I think it represents a, a span of um, imagery, kind of the way it's been depicted over time from, uh, in our case, interest in the, the mid-19th uh, century to, to today, and how the canyon's been represented uh, through photographs. We download those pictures, actually take them out to the site itself, compare the image of the place to the place, and find a way to somehow compare our experience, that one moment that we're having in time in that place to the actual picture that was made earlier by somehow embedding it into a scene at the time. You know, you, you can have all the, the data and, and the charts and the graphs and, and the scientific evidence that, that you want, but people don't necessarily relate that to what matters to them. But if they, if they see something, if, if they understand something that matters in their own life, then they change. The, this idea of, of understanding our relationship to place, to long term, to land, has everything to do, to do with what we value. But it brings us all together. And, and so in, that, in the sense that we are diverse, that diversity actually creates an interesting combination. And what humanities do is create a sense of value. That, that why this place matters. What is my connection to it? Uh, how, does it how does the history relate to where I am now and where I'm going? All these things relate to our core of where we are in place. That's the value that's created by understanding all these different things about you know, your relationship to a place. It's not about the figures and the data. That stuff then makes a difference if you understand that. Humanities are fantastically robust in terms of fields in which we can understand culture and history and, and uh, uh, social complexity and literature and human expression and all of the things that have made up the humanities. What we need to do in terms of moving things forward is we need to work on uh, making certain that the humanities uh, increasingly become central to our intellectual uh, pursuit related to sustainability. We do that by engaging humanists in the scientific and technological questions, the design of the questions themselves. Uh, and this is where we're, where we're missing out. Uh, we have insufficiently robust uh, design of the questions themselves. And so if we're pursuing sustainability as a core or central human value, then we need to reshape how we actually view ourselves and how we view the shaping of questions.